Thank you very much for tuning in to another Sunday School lesson here from the Salem Creek Church of Christ. We thank you very much for taking your time uh, to spend it with us today. We're honored by the fact that you would take time from your busy schedule to share with us. And let me say that if uh, we can do anything to assist you, or if you have a Bible question, please give us a call here at the church. Our office number is area code 615 893-7532. We would love to hear from you. Also, we have a tool that we would like to um, let you know about. It is our daily devotional guide. We have a devotional message for five days out of every week, Monday through Friday. And we're calling this uh, devotional series this year, Exploring the Book. We're going through the Word of God, trying to help people get a better understanding of what it's all about. If you'd like to have a copy of that, Give us a call, area code 615-893-7532. We'll make that available to you free of charge. We're not asking anything in return, only that you uh, get great benefit out of it in your attempt to know more about the Word of God. This, uh, this morning, we're going to be continuing our study of the book of Galatians. We're talking about Paul's tremendous defense of the biblical doctrine of justification by faith. We come to have a relationship with God through faith in Christ Jesus. We are in the third chapter of the book of Galatians. Let's read together this morning, verses 15 through 18. And in this passage, Paul says, Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant. Yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is, Christ. What I'm saying is this. The law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promises. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. And so we're talking about the tremendous doctrine of justification by faith in Christ Jesus. The question is this. Does righteousness come through law-keeping or does come through faith in Jesus Christ or faith of Christ? Galatians chapter 2 in verse 16 says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, since by the works of the law no one will be justified. And that statement, uh, by faith in Christ, could also be translated by faith of Christ. And what that would refer to, uh, if you translated it that way, which again would be a legitimate way to do it, what that would refer to would be to the gospel system. We're justified uh, through the gospel that is given through Jesus Christ. Does our righteousness come through our ability to perfectly keep a list of rules and regulations, or does it come as a result of the promise of God? In Galatians chapter 3, Paul started out by reminding his readers of their own personal experience. They, they did not receive the Spirit by the law. They received the Spirit by hearing of faith, he said in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 2. And so he said, if you have begun by the Spirit, then you've certainly not been perfected by the law. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 3. God had done his work among them with the hearing of faith, not by works of the law, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 5. In verse 6 of that chapter, he began to argue from Scripture. He started that line of reasoning with reference to Abraham in verses 6 through 9. Abraham's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Note there that he says his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. And then he drew the conclusion that those who are of faith are the true descendants of Abraham, uh, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7. God was actually preaching the good news to Abraham when he told him that 
All the nations of the earth will be blessed in you, is what Paul says in um, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8. And we'll come back to that quotation from uh, the 22nd chapter of Genesis in just a few moments. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, the argument from Scripture continued with a reminder that the righteous man shall live by his faith, Galatians 3.11 and there he quoted from the second chapter of the book of Habakkuk in the fourth verse. If the just, that is the righteous man, is to live by faith, then righteousness cannot come through law keeping because we could not perfectly keep any law. We are under a curse. And he says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse himself in Galatians chapter 3 verses 11 through 14. And then we come to our text for today, Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 18, where he makes the very important point that the promise made to Abraham was given priority over the law of Moses. I think that's a very important point in light of the fact that the people to whom he wrote the book of Galatians were seeking to be justified by keeping the law. Somebody had come along and influenced them to believe something like that. And so he argued against that by pointing out that the promises made to Abraham take priority over the law of Moses. In this particular part of um, the third chapter of the book of Galatians, by the way, Paul uses a very important word. He uses the word covenant. Let's go back to verse 15 and read where he wrote, Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. You'll notice there the word covenant. In verse 17, what I'm saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promises. Twice there, in those verses, he uses that word covenant. Now, the Greek word diatheke uh, is a word that can be translated covenant, has that meaning. It also uh, can be translated testament. It can refer to that. Uh, think about somebody who makes their last will and testament. You may recall, of course, when you think about the word covenant, that in the Old Testament, God had made a covenant with the nation of Israel, and that covenant became the foundation of that nation. Let's go back for just a moment to the 24th chapter of the book of Exodus. Very important chapter when you think about God's covenant with Israel. In beginning this chapter, the Bible says that God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Now, Moses went up on the mountain as God directed. He received the word of the Lord. He came back down. Uh, all of that happens between verse 2 and verse 3. Then beginning in verse 3 of Exodus chapter 24, the Bible says, Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning. He built an altar at the foot of the mountain and with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel. They offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood. He put it in basins and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and he said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. That's a very important passage to understand what the law was all about. They were camped there at Sinai where Moses received the Ten Commandments. He went up on the mountain in the beginning of chapter four, 24. Rather, He received the word of the Lord. He came back down. They go through this uh, covenant ceremony. Great detail about that is given. 
Animal sacrifices were offered in verse 4. And by the way, ancient covenants were always sealed with blood as sacrifices were offered. Moses took the blood of the animals that had been sacrificed, some of the blood, and he sprinkled it on the altar where their very flesh was consumed. Exodus chapter 24 and verse 6. The book of the covenant was then read to the people. In verse 7, they agreed to keep it. And then, of course, Moses did something very unusual. Blood from the sacrificial animals was then taken and, and, and sprinkled on the people. Moses spoke some very solemn words when he said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words in verse 8. And at that very solemn meeting in Exodus chapter 24, the covenant was offered, it was accepted, it was ratified, and in both a symbolic and in a literal way, that covenant was set in stone. Well, you think about the literal sense in which that happened as uh, those words were, were uh, engraven on tablets of stone. In a symbolic sense, it was set in stone in that God offered it to them. They agreed to keep it. They were bound by that. That covenant trumped everything else, or did it? Note the point that's made in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 15, where Paul says, But brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. And the, note what he said about a covenant. Once it's been ratified, it cannot be set aside. No one can add conditions to it. Well, if you read Galatians chapter 3, you find out that the covenant that he's talking about when he said that is not the one you read about in Exodus chapter 24, but it's one that was given to Abraham 430 years earlier. The, part, the promises that God made to Abraham were part of a ratified covenant. Verse 17 makes this very clear where Paul says, what I'm saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promises. Well, the Mosaic Covenant was given in Exodus chapter 24. It was given, it was accepted, it was ratified. But there was one given 430 years earlier to the patriarch Abraham. And the fact that God came along and then offered his covenant to Israel in no way ratifies the covenant that has been made with Abraham. In verse 17, Paul again used that word diatheke, the word for covenant. He used it to talk about God's promises to Abraham. Let's go back in the Old Testament to the 15th chapter of the book of uh, Exodus, or rather Genesis, and read about the covenant that God made with Abraham. Now, this is a very uh, solemn event in the life of Abraham. The chapter begins by telling us that after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram, I'm a shield to you. Your reward will be very great. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Abraham said, since you've given me no offspring, one born in my house is my heir. Notice Abraham trying to reason with God. I'm I'm well over 75 years old. I've not had any children. Let's take Eliezer of Damascus, a servant born in my house. So let him be the one. Well, in verse 4, the word of the Lord came to him saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body shall be your heir. He took him outside and said, Now look up at the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be that he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. He said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur, out of Ur the Chaldees to give you this land to possess it. And he said, O oh Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? He wanted some evidence. How can I know that what you're telling me is going to come to pass? 
And so in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 9, God said, Abram, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought all these to him, and he cut them in two and laid them in half opposite the, the other, but he did not cut the birds. The birds of prey came down upon the carcasses. Abraham drove them away. Now behold, the sun was going down, and a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation with whom they serve, and afterwards they come out with many possessions. As for you, you will go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried in a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not full yet. You see what happens here. God makes these promises to Abraham. Abraham says to God, give me some evidence that all of this is going to come to pass. And God had Abraham offer these sacrificial animals. Now remember, in ancient times, covenants were sealed with blood. They were sealed with the sacrifice of animals. That's exactly what happens there in Genesis chapter 15. Later on in Genesis chapter 17, God comes back to Abraham. He renews that covenant. Let's go to Genesis chapter 17. Well, I think this is very interesting and very important uh, in light of what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, starting in verse 1 of uh, Genesis chapter 17, the Bible tells us that when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I'm God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Now listen carefully to the words of verse 2. I will establish my covenant between me and you. I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You'll be a father of a multitude of nations. Your name will no longer be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I'll make nations of you and kings will come forth from you. Listen closely to verse 7. I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout your generations, an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. And I'll give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. So God is making a covenant here with Abraham. That covenant, of course, contains very, very important promises. This is 430 years before he gave his covenant to Moses and to the Israelites. And when you continue to read uh, from verse 9 of Genesis chapter 17, you find out that he gave him um, a physical sign of circumcision as a sign and a seal of that covenant. The covenant that God made with Abraham was uh, in some extents much larger than those two particular passages that we've read, Genesis 15 and Genesis chapter 17. They included promises, for example, the promises that God made in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, when he called Abram to leave Ur of the Chaldees. And the promises stated there are repeated throughout the life of Abraham. It reaches to the farthest horizon of Abraham's life in Genesis chapter 22, on that mountain in the land of Moriah, when he was called to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Well, God stopped Abraham from sacrificing his son and when he did, the Lord spoke, and a part of what he said to him is found in Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 through 18, where he said to the patriarch, By myself I have sworn, I will multiply greatly your seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Promise of God given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 stated that in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Well, that's a very definitely 
that very definitely contains a reference to the Jewish nation to whom the Mosaic Covenant was given 430 years later. In that statement in Genesis chapter 22, in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed, there is much more than just a reference to the Jewish people, the physical descendants of Abraham. God's word included that promise of blessing. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Genesis 22 and verse 18. By the way, if our reading of Genesis is correct, those are the very last words that God spoke to Abraham. As you read through scripture, the last recorded words that God spoke to Abraham are found in Genesis 22 and verse 18 where he says to him, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That law by which some people in Galatia were seeking to be justified came 430 years after that promise was made to Abraham. The point that Paul makes in Galatians chapter 3 in verse 17 is that it cannot invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God. It cannot nullify the promise. The promise that God made to Abraham stands firm. It is the thing that has priority. Now, all of that may sound confusing. It really shouldn't be. Here's the point that he's making in Galatians chapter 3. The gospel is not based on law. Our Righteousness, our salvation, does not come by law-keeping. The gospel is not based on law, but it's on, based on the promises of God. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. By the way, go back with me in your mind for just a moment to the gospel of Luke in the opening chapter. Mary found out that she was with child, Mary the mother of Jesus. She went to see Elizabeth, her cousin, who is going to be the mother of John the Baptist. She went to see Elizabeth prior to the birth of John the Baptist. And when she did, she found great reason to praise the Lord. She exalted the Lord by saying, He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his descendants. King James Version there uses the word seed, and it's singular. He spoke to Abraham and to his seed forever. Luke chapter 1, verse 55. Moses, or rather, Mary used the singular form of the word seed. God was speaking to Abraham, to his seed. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8, Paul quoted the promise of God from uh, Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, and he said something very remarkable there. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all nations will be blessed in you. Wow, that's, that's just absolutely astounding. He gives that promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18. The last recorded words of God to Abraham in all of Scripture are these, in you and your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Paul looked at that and he said that when God spoke those words, he was well beforehand, preaching the gospel to Abraham. What is that good news? That good news is that we're justified by faith. In verse 16 of Galatians chapter 3, Paul made the point. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, to your seed, that is, to Christ. And his conclusion is that the inheritance is not based on law. It is based on the promise of God. If righteousness comes through law-keeping, it couldn't be on the basis of a promise, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 18. But the fact is that righteousness is on the basis of the promise of God, not on the basis of our ability to keep the law. And Paul says God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Whether we realize it or not, there is a very powerful affirmation of the gospel. What is a gospel? That word gospel simply means good news. God's good news is that the promise of salvation is on the basis of faith. Romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore being justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are reconciled to God. I think it gives us such a tremendous sense of comfort and assurance. Would you prefer to attempt to achieve, to have righteousness on the basis of your ability to perfectly keep some kind of list of rules and regulations, or would you prefer to have it on the basis of the promise of God? I can't speak for you, and I don't know about you, but I do know this. I, I don't trust myself to perfectly keep any kind of law, any kind of list of rules and regulations. I, I have to accept the truth of Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that includes me. I've already proven in my life that I can't perfectly keep the law of God. On the other hand, think about God. Think about his perfect faithfulness. God has made promise of eternal life. He's made a lot of promises. One of those is the promise of eternal life. We question whether or not Righteousness can be a reality for us. Does God keep his word? Is he going to fulfill that promise? Paul introduced his letter to Titus, written sometime after the book of Galatians was written, well after the book of Galatians was written, when he wrote to Titus. He wrote that letter from a prison cell. He introduced it in this way. He identified himself as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Titus chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And that reading comes from the King James Version. As we bring our message to a close this morning, I want you to think about those words. And Paul talks about he is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's apostle according to the faith of God's elect, according to the acknowledging the truth, which is after godliness. And he does this, he says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. The character of God is such that he cannot lie. It is impossible for God to lie. He has given us the promise of eternal life. Would you prefer to try to achieve your standing with God on the basis of your own ability to perfectly keep some kind of law or on the basis of a promise made by a God who cannot lie? I can't speak for you, but I know that I can't perfectly keep the law of God. I'm a sinner. I come short of the glory of God. But God has made a promise that, I will, that if I will accept what he offers through the obedience of faith, eternal life will be my treasure. And the God who made that promise cannot lie. And you know what? I would like to be able to share with you the good news of how that promise can be fulfilled in your own life. If you have a question about anything we've talked about this morning, give us a call here. Area code 615-893-7532. Again, we'd also like to share with you this very valuable tool exploring the book, our daily devotional guide for uh, this current year. If we can serve you in any way, give us a call. Bow with me as we close today with prayer. Father, we're so thankful to you for promises made long ago, promises made by a God who cannot lie. We are so thankful that we can trust you, that we can depend upon you. Help us, Father, to have our minds freed from the burden that comes from thinking we have to earn our standing with you. And understand that it can be ours, not based on our own perfection, but through the obedience of faith as we serve you, as we answer your call, as we do the things that you would have us to do. Forgive us, we pray. Keep us in your love and your protection. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much for tuning in. May God richly bless you all.